Amen. So Genesis chapter 28, uh, part I want to look at there is beginning in verse 10 where the Bible reads, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God descend, ascending and descending upon it. And the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the, and, and the, land, uh, the land where thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So, of course, this is a real familiar passage here uh, that's often referred to as Jacob's Ladder. Who's prob everyone probably in the room has probably heard it of Jacob's Ladder at some point or another. And this is what it's referring to is because this is when, of course, Jacob is looking out and he sees this vision. He dreams this dream of a ladder coming down from heaven. And he sees the angels going up and down upon it. And really, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that tired, title to call it Jacob's Ladder. I, I understand why people call that. But I think when we start to understand the, the, the symbology of this ladder, uh, this vision that he's given, that really it would be probably more aptly called or correctly called uh, Heaven's Ladder. Because really it's not Jacob's Ladder. He didn't set it up. right? This is something that God showed him. So again, nothing wrong with that title. I wouldn't fault anybody for using that. But when I read this story and I start, we start to see the parallels uh, here in, uh, in the, between this ladder and that of Christ's ministry, you know, really what would probably be the more correct thing to call it is Heaven's Ladder. And that's the title of the sermon, Heaven's Ladder. And really, there's some interesting things about this vision and this passage of Scripture that, scripture that really parallel Christ's ministries in a lot of ways. And I, I just kind of want to look at those this morning and, and just see how you can look at this vision even all the way back in the Old Testament and you can see Christ. And that's the amazing thing about the Bible is that you can read any book in the Bible. You can go from, from beginning, from Genesis, all the way through to Revelation. Christ is in every single book of the Bible. You find him in Genesis, you find him in Exodus, you find him in uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus, uh, or excuse me, I already said that, Leviticus, Numbers, so on and so forth. There isn't a book in the Bible that you can turn to and not find Christ there. And this is, a, I think, a great example, a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Now let's go ahead and just look at it. One of the, probably the first and, and strongest parallel is here where it says in verse 12, Behold the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. I think that's the strongest and most obvious parallel. So obviously, keep something in Genesis 28, but turn over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> John chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 47. The Bible says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest uh, thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee that I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So just like uh, Jacob back in, in Genesis, he saw that, that ladder that went into heaven and he saw angels ascending and descending upon it. You know, that's a picture, I believe, of Jesus Christ because here you see Jesus saying, hey, you're going to see angels ascending and descending upon me. He says, Nathaniel, don't be surprised by the fact that I, saw, that I said that I saw you before well, when you sat on, sat on the fig tree. You're going to see greater things than these. And truly, Nathaniel did see greater things than that in Christ's ministry. And one of the things he saw, and we'll look at it here, is many in, in a few instances where we actually see angels coming and ministering unto Christ, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. I'll remind us of some familiar passages where Jesus uh, had the angels come and ascend and, uh, ascend and descend upon him. It says here in Mark chapter 10, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Of course, this is the temptation of Christ. And it says, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with wild beasts, and the angel, was he in Tucson? Uh, anyway. <laughs> and, and it goes on and he says, And the angels ministered unto him. So we see when Christ went out and he was, uh, you know, in the wilderness, when he was there fasting those 40 days, the angels uh, descended upon him and they ministered unto him. Now that's what he was referring to there, I believe, when, when he talked to, when he said that to Nathaniel, that he would see heaven open and the angels uh, of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Again, in Luke 22, it says in verse 39, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. So, of course, this is when Christ went into the uh, garden to pray before his crucifixion. And it says there, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, a straightening, a strengthening him. 
So in Christ's ministry, you see this taking place. Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 51, uh, this, would, you know, this is more uh, just showing you the fact that Christ you know, could have called many angels anytime he wanted. He says in verse 51, And behold, one of them uh, which, were with their, uh, which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests uh, the high priest, and smote off his ear. Of course, that was Peter. And then saith Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. Uh, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now call to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. So Jesus could have called, and they would have descended upon the Son of Man and delivered him. Uh, you see, we could think of another, you know, even after Christ's resurrections, when, when Mary came into the sepulcher, what did she see? She see two angels in white sitting. So even, even then, we see angels coming upon the Son of Man often in his ministry. And Jesus even saying, hey, I could call him anytime I want. So I think that's a really strong parallel between Jesus Christ and this ladder that, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of Genesis chapter 28. This, this parallel between the angels ascending and descending upon it. Now another parallel is the fact that this ladder was set up on the earth. And really that's a picture of the fact that Jesus was sent from heaven uh, to minister upon the earth to man. You know, Jesus didn't just manifest out of nothing. Jesus came from heaven and was born a virgin. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus didn't become God at his birth. God, Jesus Christ has always been. He was set upon the earth. He came from heaven and came to man. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> and it just shows us the fact that he came down to heaven. This ladder... Remember, this ladder in Genesis 28 was set upon the earth. It wasn't set up on earth. It was set down up. And when he says it was set upon earth, it was set, I mean, he came down from heaven and was set there. You know, Jacob wasn't the one that set that up. There wasn't somebody else like lifting up a ladder into heaven. This ladder, I believe, came down from heaven and set upon earth. It came from heaven to earth. I think that's a picture there of Jesus Christ. He says there in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, For verily he took on him, uh, not on him, the nature of angels, but he took on uh, him the seed of Abraham. That wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and, high and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. So you see that Jesus Christ was made like unto the seed of Abraham. He took on the seed of Abraham, meaning he was already there. He already existed uh, before his earthly ministry. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Bible says in Philippians 2, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he was God, thought it not robbery to, e uh, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So he took it upon him. That, that ladder was set upon the earth. Look at John chapter 3, verse 12. He said, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe? If I tell you of heavenly things, and no man, uh, and how should you believe if, if I tell you of heavenly things? Verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Jesus is saying, hey, look, I came down from heaven. So can we see that there's this parallel here between Jesus Christ and this ladder and, and Jacob, uh, Jacob's vision of Genesis 28? How it is that you know, we see that the angels ministering unto it, we see the angels ascending and descending upon it, we see it coming down to, from heaven to earth. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. And we see Jesus Christ uh, saying that you know, he came down from heaven just like that ladder did. <clears throat> God was manifest in the flesh. He came down from heaven. John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said, For I came down from heaven to not to do my own will, but rather the will of him that sent me. Jump down to verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Is there any question about where Jesus came from? He came down from heaven. This is that bread which came, verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, uh, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And what's great about John 6, you say, this is a little far-fetched, Brother Corbin. I mean, you're comparing this ladder to Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus compared himself to the manna. And this is, this is a concept that you find throughout Scripture. 
where different things in the Bible represent Christ. You think of the, ser the serpent that Moses raised up in the wilderness was a picture of Christ taking upon him the sins of the world. Uh, you know, think of the rock it, 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 that was split when, when they crossed the Red Sea and water gushed out of it. That was a picture of Christ being smitten for us and eternal waters flowing out of him. You know, there's all these pictures throughout the Bible of Jesus Christ. I mean, we could probably go around the room this morning and just each, you know, we could all probably think of one. You know, and there's just a multitude of them. So should it really surprise us that there's parallels between Genesis chapter 28 and, and the ministry and person of Jesus Christ? It shouldn't. We could think of the animal skins that clothed Adam and Eve. That was a picture of Christ, God's covering of sin, for, of sin through the sacrifice of another. You could think of uh, the first laying of Abel's offering. That was a picture of Jesus Christ. Abraham's sacrifice of his only son Isaac was a picture of Jesus Christ. This is all throughout Scripture. Uh, you could think about the blood upon the doorpost in Egypt. That was a picture of the blood of Christ. In fact, he told them to put it on the two side posts and the lentil, and if you think about it, that actually makes a cross. So these are all these pictures that go back all the way throughout Scripture. <clears throat> so it shouldn't surprise us that this ladder is a parallel uh, of, of Christ and his ministry. The ladder was set upon earth. You know, it was showing us it came down from heaven just as Jesus descended from heaven at the virgin birth. <clears throat> you know, and again, it's worth noting that what happened at his birth, there were angels, right, present there as well. So we see these angels again, uh, praising God. Uh, another parallel we could see is the fact that it reached to the top of heaven. If you notice there in Genesis 28, it says in verse, uh, verse 12, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth. So that's one parallel. Uh, the top of it reached to heaven, right? That would be another parallel. So that would show, you know, we look first of all that Christ ascended or descended down to earth, right? Well, this could be a picture of the fact that Christ ascended into heaven. You know, there's really two parallels here in this, in this, this phrase, the top of it reached to heaven. And of course, in Acts 1, if you would turn over to Acts, in fact, turn over to Acts. In Acts 1, verse 9, then when he had spoken these things, they while they beheld, he was taken up and the cloud received them out of their sight. You know what I love about the Bible is that it, he, God so often just tells us what happened, but he doesn't give a lot of detail, right? He didn't tell us at what speed he went up. He didn't tell us, you know, you know how, what, what rate of speed he ascended into heaven. How, you, know, you know what I mean? There's all these different, you could just kind of use your imagination. And we're going to look at that here a little bit more about this ladder. God just tells you these things, and I think he just lets man not draw his own conclusions about necessarily about what everything means, but... He lets you use your own imagination to, to see these things in, with your mind's eye. And I, whenever I read this, it says, while they beheld, he was taken up. And I always think about, like, if, it, you know, if you let go of a helium balloon, it kind of goes up like that, you know. It's, I don't think he took off like a rocket. You know, I think he slowly ascended up in heaven, and he spake these things while he was going up. I mean, if you have something important to say and you want someone to get through it, you know, often you'll do something dramatic to, to kind of, you know, make an impression upon them. I mean, what could be... I'm sure a lot of you would snap out of it this morning and remember this sermon if all of a sudden I just, you know, started to send up into the... <laughs> you know, hit the ceiling tile and it's kind of <laughs> got stuck. But, you know what I mean? That, and I think that's what was going on here. Jesus is trying to make a very strong impression. I could just see this in my mind's eye when I read this about him just slowly... What an, impress, uh, an impression that would have made. And he says there in verse 10, And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he, as he went up, behold, two men... Uh, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? Well, I, I don't know, maybe because we just saw the Lord descend into it. You know, <laughs> it seems like one of those questions, you know, like, duh. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, uh, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So again, note there as well. Who do, what do we see? We see angels. So we see angels so often associated with Christ's ministries. And that's what we see in Genesis 28 in this ladder. So that's one, you know, that phrase there, the, the top of it reached to heaven, that could be a parallel of Christ's ascension into heaven, right? But I think another and probably a more, you know, more uh, significant or uh, applicable uh, parallel would be the fact that that ladder, you know, is a means of access. You know, that's what you use a ladder for, to get somewhere you couldn't otherwise get. You know, if you can't, you know, reach, you know, up onto the roof, you know, we, we have to often get ladders out to, to gain access to these things. Well, you know, none of us is going to get to heaven on our own good works. None of us is going to get to heaven on our own merit. We're not going to live a good enough life in order to earn heaven. You know, we're not going to, you know, 
do whatever all these you know man has all these means that he thinks he's going to get to heaven by but this ladder coming down shows us that there's only one way into heaven and it's by Christ that he is the only means of access into heaven <clears throat> Jesus saith unto him in John 14 I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me there's only one way in there's only one way up and it's up that ladder and that's the only way you're going to get there look there in Acts chapter 4 if you're still there Acts chapter 4 Acts chapter 4, look there at verse 12. In Acts 4, verse 12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, there's only one way in. Jacob only saw one ladder that day. He didn't see a multitude of ladders. You know, this one's over here is Buddha. This one's over here is Muhammad. You know, there's only one ladder that's going to reach into heaven, and that's the ladder of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Another parallel we could look at, so far we've looked at, uh, and if you would turn over to Acts 10, we've looked at the fact that we saw the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. And we saw the angels over and over again. We keep seeing them in Christ's ministry. We saw that that ladder was set upon the earth. The fact that it came down from heaven and was here upon earth, just as Jesus Christ came down from heaven and was born of a virgin. We see also... Uh, uh, that the, the, the ladder reached the top of heaven, just like Christ, you know, ascended into heaven. And not only that, that he's that only means into heaven. <clears throat> but I believe that, you know, this fourth parallel, which is very similar to the third one, is, is there in verse, uh, and I'll read to this to you, in verse 16 of Genesis 28, or verse 17, it says, uh, of course, at the end of the vision, you know, Jacob wakes up and he says, and he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So he's saying, Look, this is the gate of heaven. And again, it's interesting, you know, God gives us, you know, just tells us what Jacob sees, but he leaves it, again, he leaves it up to our, our own imagination to, to see exactly what it is he saw. We don't know. But whatever he saw, it led him to say, and this is just kind of a side note, How dreadful is this place? You know, exclamation point. This made an impression upon Jacob. And he woke up and he was afraid. He said, this place is dressed, it says, he, and he was afraid. You know, he woke up with a start and, and was startled by what he saw. I mean, you know, often we have these, like, these images of the things we read in the Bible. Maybe if we were in a Sunday school class, you know, we saw some stupid drawing or flannel glare of a, of a ladder coming down, you know. It doesn't do it justice. What Jacob saw here, I mean, if we could just stop for a minute and think about what he actually saw. I mean, how, how many angels were there? I mean, was it a great multitude? How big was this ladder? Was it an actual a ladder like we think of it? Or was it more like steps? How, you know, how vast was it? Was it shining? I mean, the brightness it must have had, the shining. Just, just an amazing vision that he has. So amazing, in fact, that he wakes up and says that it says that he was afraid. And he says, this place is dreadful. It is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So he likens it there unto the gate of heaven. And of course, you know, that would be likened unto Jesus Christ again. Because what is a gate? It's a means of access, right? It's what we would call a door. You know, if you had a pen of some kind, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't say, you, you know, you, you would have a door somewhere in that gate or in that, in, that, uh, in that pen. You wouldn't call it a door, you'd call it a gate, right? But it's the same thing. It's on hinges, it opens, it closes. It's a means in and out of that pen or in and out of that uh, place you're trying to get to. So he says in John 10, I'll read to you, uh, Then Jesus saith uh, unto them again, Verily, verily, uh, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. You know, what is he talking about? He's not, I am the gate. I am the door. These, are, these, these, are, uh, these terms are the same. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, the, uh, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is likened unto this gate too, I believe in Jacob, uh, or excuse me, in Genesis 28. You know, he is the gate of heaven. He's the only way you're going to get in there. He's the only means of access. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, this really, these parallels should remind us that salvation is through Christ. And that's probably the greatest uh, imagery that we're, we get out of this. This is probably the truth that, that we should be getting from uh, this vision, is that there's only one means to heaven. And, the Bible, and, and, and it should just remind us that salvation is through Christ. And again, you say, well, you know, this just seems, this seems a little far-fetched. But the Bible says at, at the beginning, and, the, uh, and when Jesus was, um, you know, he met his, his disciples on the road to Damascus, it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them 
in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus, when they, when he, after his resurrection, he meets his disciples going to the road to Damascus. He meets two of them. And it says, he be, at, beginning at Moses, not just at Moses, but beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, saying, look, let me show you in the Bible all the things that talk about me, all the things that point to me, all the things that are a picture of me, all the things that prophesy of me. And that's, you know, so again, this is not a far-fetched concept in Scripture that Jesus has found in all these, these different uh, parallels and, and symbology and pictures and just all these uh, places we can turn to in Scripture and see Christ on every page. And that says there in Acts 10 where you are, and look at verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So again, the Scriptures, you know, all the, all the prophets give witness to Christ. And not just that, you know, what is the point of it? That whosoever believeth in him shall, not, uh, shall receive remission of sins. Again, what's the one thing you have to do there? Believe. What's the one mean into heaven? Faith in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. <coughs> Jesus said in John 5, Search the scriptures, for in, the, uh, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they, they are, and they are they which testify of me. He said, look, the scriptures testify of me. <clears throat> you know, this proves something really great, too, is that the Old Testament saints had the testimony of Scripture to show them that salvation was by grace through faith. You know, Jacob understood something. Salvation was by grace through faith. They, he knew through this vision that one day there was going to be a, made, a way made into heaven and that that was the way in. It was through Christ. That God was going to provide a way. Abraham, when he you know, w was told to sacrifice his son, he knew that was a picture of the fact that you know Christ one day is going to God is going to sacrifice His own Son, and all these pictures in the Old Testament are, are are giving witness to Jesus Christ, meaning that the Old Testament states they understood salvation all the way. There wasn't some different way of getting saved back then, you know. And this is a whole other sermon, and, you know. And I, I don't like to just throw things out there without backing them up, but there's a lot of people out there that say, well, you know, we get saved by we get saved by faith today, but back then it was by works. You know, and in the future, during the tribulation, it's going to be by works again. Like God's just going to keep switching up on everybody. And you're going to have to figure out where you fall in God's timeline to, to figure out how you're going to get saved today. No, it's always by, been by grace. Throughout all Scripture, all the Scripture here gives testimony. All the prophets give testimony. All, you know, all these things prophesy and give testimony to Christ, the fact that salvation is by grace through faith. Even this ladder in Jacob 28, it shows us that there's one way into heaven. It's through Christ. <clears throat> The Bible says in Romans 4, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. You know, that's what, that's what uh, Abraham's righteousness was. It wasn't his works. It wasn't the fact that, you know, he was sacrificing animals. It was the fact that he believed God. He had faith in what God told him. And that was counted uh, as righteousness to him. So one of the great things about this is that, you know, this shows us that salvation has always been by grace, that the Old Testament saints, they had this witness even uh, back then of Christ, that they could understand salvation by grace through faith. But really what it, I, I think is even better than that is that, uh, or what's more uh, appropriate here is what this sermon should be showing us <laughs> is that it just testifies to the richness and the uniqueness of the Bible. There's no other book that does this. There's no other book on this earth that has so many different authors, I mean, spanning thousands of years and, uh, that are telling just this deeply interwoven story that just fits together like a hand in a glove, just comes together perfectly. I mean, Genesis was written all those thousands of years ago. Right. And it, it gives a perfect picture of Jesus Christ and his ministry. I mean, it's written by different authors. See, oh, it's just one big conspiracy. It's impossible. And it just testifies that how, you know, what we have in our hands when we have the Bible. You have a book that's like no other. That just, it, it, it has all the, just these rich, deep truths, all these great pictures, all these beautiful pictures that if we would just pick it up and read it, we could see for ourselves. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. You know, why am I preaching this? Because I want the point of the sermon is to, to try and inspire people to read the Bible. You know, hey, how did I figure this out? How did I see this? You know, let me demonstrate how I how I how I came across this, this truth in the Bible. 
right like this. I got in it, and I read, and I kept reading, and then I read some more, Amen. and then I kept reading, and then I read some more. And that's how I saw it. I just came across it, reading it. You know, and that's what I want people to do. Uh, we should be people that read this book. Yeah. You know, not just for our own benefit. I mean, but, you know, it is to our benefit. Isn't that what it says there in Second Peter? You do well that you take heed unto this prophecy as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. I always love that analogy he gives there as a light that shines in a dark place. You know, if, you, if, it was, if it's dark, the first thing, you walk in at home at night with no lights around, what's the first thing you do? Try and feed the cat? In the dark, you know? No. You find the light switch. You don't even think about it. You just walk and click, and it's on. You know, you do that right away. But how quickly do we pick up the light that we have in this dark world? It says it shines as a light in a dark place. Is there any question that the how dark this world is right now? I mean, I know the sun is shining out there, but if we could see it spiritually, it's dark. And it's getting darker. And we need this light. And I'm trying to just, you know, take this, this small, simple truth today about this vision that Jacob had and just inspire you to read the Bible because that's how I saw it. You know, I'm not saying I have some divine revelation from God that God somehow gave me. I just was reading it and said, hey, this, this reminds me of Jesus. What a, what a beautiful picture. Maybe if I preach this, this will inspire other people to pick up the Bible and look for Jesus in the Bible. Because, you know, I remember, I, I remember uh, well, just recently, a little while back, Pastor Anderson preaching a, a, a series of sermons. You know, Jesus in Exodus, Jesus in Leviticus, just going through all the Old Testament. You know, I, and, I, and, and, and it was funny, he'd start that series right as I had just finished my reading my, the Bible through. And I was about to reset and start reading the Bible through again. I said, you know what, I'm going to read through and I'm going to look for Jesus as I go. And sure enough, you find him if you just look. But you're never going to look if you, if you don't, you're never going to find it if you don't look. You're never going to find these type of things. You're never going to see these things if you don't pick up that book and read it. Even if it's for 10, 15 minutes a day, something. Get in there and read that book. Why? Because it's dark. It's your light. It's going to guide you. It's going to lead you. <coughs> he says there uh, <coughs> in Psalm 138, I will worship toward thy, high, uh, thy, thy holy temple. Hey, it's good to be in church, right? It's good to come to the holy temple and worship. It's good to come into God's house and be with God's people. He said, I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. It's good to praise God and give him the glory that's due unto his name. And he ends there and says, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You know, it, all those things are great to do, but we need to be in his word because he's magnified it above all his name. You know, consider how loving of God it is to give us such a sure testimony of himself in the form of the scripture. And that's a very gracious thing. I mean, God's not hi playing hide and seek with us. God's not, you know, trying to hide from humanity. You know, he, he wants them to know who he is. And he's published a book, you know, the King, in the King James Bible. He's preserved for us, in, for the English-speaking people, the King James Bible. The most popular book of all time. The best-selling book that's ever been. We have that. God, you know, it's in every dollar store. It, we've, got, we've got dozens of them laying around. It's everywhere. You think God's trying to hide from, from people? No. It's just they don't want, they don't want that God. No, I don't want to read about that one. They want to make a God in their own image. He's magnified his word above his name. Consi you know, that's a very loving thing for him to have done, to make his word so abundant, so that we could know who he is. <laughs> the Bible says in Psalm 92, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither do a fool uh, doth understand this. So he says, look, thy works and thy thoughts are very deep, Lord. He says, wow, he's amazed at this, how deep God is, how deep God's thoughts are. And then he goes on and says, a brutish man knoweth not. Now, what, what's a brutish man? Well, that's an old-fashioned way of saying stupid. A stupid man doesn't know. He's like, a, he's like a dumb animal. Neither doth a fool understand this. You know, the dummy, the fool, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't understand how deep God is, how great his works are and his thoughts. You know, dumb people, they don't know a thing about the Bible. And fools, they can't understand it. But, you know, you know I'm not saying that to pick on them. It's, it's unfortunate. We you know what that should do. It should cause us to consider ourselves privileged. That we do know it. That we can pick it up. And that we can understand it. That we have the Spirit of Christ. That we're not like fools. That we're not like dumb people who just don't know anything about God. 
that we can pick up the Bible, we can learn about God, we can know who God is, and understand some very uh, deep things about Him. You know, and that's really the point of the sermon this morning, is just trying to motivate people to continue to read their Bibles, and to get in it, and to see these great truths for yourself, and to, and, and to, to have God show you something out of the Word of God yourself, and then you can step back and, and praise God for it, and say, wow, thy thoughts are very deep. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, maybe I, this didn't impress anybody in this morning, but I know when I saw that, I stepped back and said, wow, God, that's amazing. That's deep that you have this picture of Jesus Christ in Genesis 28. And I praise God for it. <clears throat> you know, the Bible is a beautiful book, and it's full of all these just deep truths that, and they just, that just testify to the fact that it's divine. There's no denying it. The only, the only way this book could be is if God wrote it. But here's the question. Do we read it? The books, yeah, it's beautiful. You know, that's great. You know what? Read it. If you believe that, you'll read it. Let's go ahead and pray.